I'm Grant Underwood, a professor of history at Brigham Young University. It's my pleasure to introduce four uh, fine scholars this afternoon and friends of mine. You can all read the um, bios. So rather than just read the bios, I'm going to add a little something about each of these individuals. Mauro Properzi, if you want to try to say it in the uh, proper Italian fashion. Mauro Properzi uh, teaches at Brigham Young University, and when he first came, I and many others were extremely excited because of his training, background, and experience. You can see he comes from Italy. He has experience at the Pontifical University there, and my particular connection with him is that he worked under Douglas Davies. Since we're in a Mormon studies conference, we ought to name Doug Davies, um, an Anglican priest who decades ago started a small Mormon studies program at the University of Nottingham, then moved to Durham and continued that program. And it was at Durham that Mauro studied under him. Uh, he's written an introduction to Mormonism published by Cambridge University Press, which is top notch and evidences his immersion in the field. And Mauro studied with him and has been a close uh, colleague of his. And we were delighted to land Mauro at Brigham Young University. Um, Brian Birch, I think you all know. Uh, maybe everyone doesn't know the way he is <clears throat> such a pioneer in many things. You probably know he launched almost single-handedly the religious studies program here at this university 20 years ago and has been shepherding that ever since. Uh, brought in capable people like uh, Boyd Peterson uh, to handle the Mormon studies dimension. You also might be interested that as, again, a sign of his gifts and in creative energies, he was appointed recently to or invited to be part of the World Parliament of Religions Board. Uh, he served on the Board of Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, things like that. But he is the kind of an individual who is not only a scholar, but a very effective administrator as well and uh, facilitates other scholars in their work. So we're delighted to have these two capable individuals, and we'll turn the time over to them now. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank Boyd and uh, Brian for the invitation. It's a, it's a return to UVU for me. I, I was here five years ago um, teaching as a poor adjunct instructor before getting a full-time job, and very much enjoyed my experience here. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today, and this is one of the pictures that I like to use when I do anything having to do with Catholicism and Mormonism. It's a, it's a nice way to put the two of them together. This is a picture from uh, Nauvoo, and you can see the uh, uh, steeple of the St. Peter's and Paul Catholic Church, and next to it, the uh, Nauvoo LDS Temple. Ecclesiology or the theological study of the church is central to the identity of any religious institution. Through ecclesiology, religions define themselves in relation to God, other religious groups, and wider society, and demarcate their structures of authority, organization, and internal dynamics. Ecclesiology also provides the framework for the for formulation of salvific goals, both in the present context of mortality and the and in the eschaton of soteriology, by giving meaning to the rituals and ethical standards that aim to achieve these very objectives. Thus, ecclesiology necessarily overlaps with and is informed by other theological disciplines, like soteriology, sacramental and moral theology, the theology of religions, missiology, eschatology, and so on, and many other ologies. So historically, uh, Protestants have not paid as much attention to ecclesiology as Catholics and Orthodox have. Indeed, Protestantism has been labeled ecclesiologically challenged. Or to put it in Benjamin Warfield's words, the Reformation was the ultimate triumph of Augustine's doctrine of grace over his doctrine of the church. 
At present, however, Protestantism has grown to recognize ecclesiology's significance so as to give rise to distinctive forms of Lutheran, Reformed, Methodist, and Evangelical ecclesiologies. Ecclesiology, then, is a vibrant field of theological inquiry that now spans most Christian denominations and worship styles. The meaning, structure, purpose, and relations of the church will probably continue to be studied for years to come with recent expansions involving a turn to ethnography that aims to embody ecclesiology in the practical experiences of everyday Christians. Ecclesiological questions and implications also affect the identity of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Douglas Davis, a British scholar of Mormonism, has even claimed that Mormon theology is essentially an ecclesiology. It is a theology of the church established by prophecy through its two major priesthoods and its wider supporting organization. Yet, since LDS ecclesiastical authorities, educators, and common members do not usually reflect upon the church in formal theological terms, nor do they generally employ the methods and questions that characterize theological endeavors, it is appropriate to ask whether such a thing as a Mormon ecclesiology exists. Certainly, Mormons are ecclesiologically conscious in the broad sense of the term. They speak repeatedly and highly of the church, which is spelled with a capital C, see their faith as intricately enmeshed with the church's nature, purpose, and claims, understand church structure to be significant and divinely ordained, and their sense of religious identity largely derives from particular conceptualizations of the church's history and doctrine. To look at it differently, some aspects of Mormon ecclesiology are explicitly articulated, while others are not. Thus, the church's purposes or missions are numbered and defined, and its organization, policies, and administrative procedures are detailed in the two-volume handbook of pragmatic ecclesiology, which leaders often consult. At the same time, while several adjectives are employed to qualify the church, true, living, restored, etc., very little discussion exists about what the church actually is conceptually, possibly because the answer is already assumed. Moreover, engagements with broader Christian discussions about the nature of the church have mostly been infrequent, superficial, and often polemical, with blame to be shared between both sides. Yet, it, is, it does not have to be so. In fact, I would suggest that Mormon ecclesiology could greatly benefit from the extensive ecclesiological work that has emerged in other Christian traditions, especially at the conceptual level, while Christianity at large could also find something to learn from the pragmatic ecclesiology of Mormonism. To be sure, the distinction between theoretical and pragmatic ecclesiologies goes only so far. The pragmatic dimension needs a theoretical foundation, and theoretical articulations call for pragmatic implementations in order to be relevant. Thus, Mormonism could benefit from deeper theological reflections on the definition of the church, because these considerations may be instrumental in addressing some of the challenges and tensions that characterize contemporary Mormonism. To this end, I've found Catholic ecclesiology to be particularly helpful. Indeed, Catholicism is in many ways the natural interlocutor for Mormonism's ecclesiological engagement with the broader Christian world. True, the LDS Church was born in a Protestant American context, and its lay clergy and weekly worship services resemble low church patterns of religious expression more than they do highly ritualized masses or divine liturgies. Still, Mormonism's claims of apostolic succession of its priesthood, its temple ceremonies, its emphasis on the salvific significance of ordinances, and its hierarchical structure, to name only a few reasons, make Catholicism a preferred destination for dialogue. Whether Mormon ecclesiology also has something to offer to Catholicism, I will leave Catholic scholars to decide. In recent decades, the Catholic Church has given significant theological attention to the subject of the Church, and its ex ecclesiological reflections have been especially rich. Ecclesiology was indeed at the center of many discussions and deliberations of the Second Vatican Council, which ended exactly 50 years ago, with several of its resulting documents addressing ecclesiology to one degree or another. In addition to Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, Gaudium et Spes, pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Unitatis Redintegratio, degree on ecumenism, and Nostretate, the declaration on the church's relation to non-Christian religions, 
highlighted various aspects of the church's self-understanding, as well as the ensuing implications for the realm of interaction with non-Catholics. While these documents are the primary source for Catholic ecclesiological reflections of recent decades, the specific ecclesiological formulation of Cardinal Avery Dulles, as articulated in his book, Models of the Church, continues to be a landmark of Catholic uh, ecclesiology. Just uh, as a little bit of background on, on Dulles, um, a fascinating history, grew up in a prominent Presbyterian family, uh, felt that he was an atheist, however, converted to Catholicism and Christianity at Harvard Law School of all places, uh, was ordained to the priesthood and became, was made a, a cardinal by Pope John Paul II, one of the few who became a cardinal without having been a bishop first. Uh, in, LDS, uh, in an LDS context, it would be like becoming a member of the 70 without having been a state president or, or a bishop uh, before that. Um, so quite uh, unusual. Uh, by the way, Washington uh, Dulles Airport is named after his father, who was a prominent uh, politician in uh, the Eisenhower administration, uh, one of the secretaries. Dulles conceptualized the Catholic Church in terms of five coexisting models, emerging from five distinct images that are used to make sense of a reality as complex as the Catholic Church. To use his words, when an image is employed reflectively and critically to deepen one's theoretical understanding of a reality, it becomes what is today called a model. Dulles added a sixth model at a later time as he argued for the need to include every image that he proposed into existing conceptualizations of the church, thus keeping them in proper balance with each other. Indeed, each model has advantages and disadvantages, and each model, if excessively emphasized, can lead to distortions. To consider only one model is like looking at only one face of a cube with different depictions on each of its sides, while arguing that the whole of the cube looks like only one of its faces. In this context, Dulles deemed the expansion of understandings of the church to be one of the great theological achievements of Vatican II. The first of Dulles's models is the church as institution, the predominant ecclesiological understanding prior to Vatican II. This model describes the church as the perfect society, to use Bellarmine's words, which is organized hierarchically according to a specific structure of authority based on apostolic succession and historical continuity through the centuries. It is an institution with divine approbation, the rock of Matthew 16, the kingdom of God on the earth, and the ultimate source of teaching, sanctifying, and governing in the world. The advantages of this model include clear boundaries between insiders and outsiders, a strong sense of corporal identity, and guidance that strengthens certainty in a world of uncertainty. Conversely, this model may be susceptible to abuses of power, clericalism, legalism, and triumphalism, and the kind of exclusivism that is unpalatable to a modern pluralistic society. Yet, radical exclusivism is not the unavoidable result of this model, since Lumen Gentium specifies that the Church of Christ, constituted and organized in the world as a society, subsists in the Catholic Church, although many elements of sanctification and truth are found outside of its visible structure. The second model is the Church as communion or mystical communion which stresses the fellowship and the interpersonal relations that exist among the faithful and between them and God. It is a mystical communion because all the biblical images used to describe it, body of Christ, people of God, and temple of the Holy Spirit, point to the inherent presence of the Trinity in its manifestations. Hence, this union or unity of relationships is to be built on such virtues as love, forgiveness, and commitment. It is a model that stresses the need to embody ecclesiology into the pragmatic dimension of sanctified interpersonal relationships. It also facilitates a strong sense of belonging and makes widespread participation vital to both spiritual and visible dimensions of the church. It is democratic, it highlights the gifts and activity of the Holy Spirit, and it stresses the importance of individual contributions to communitarian well-being. At the same time, to speak of mystical communion with Christ may excessively divinize the church or its members, thus leading to difficulties in dealing with its humanity and unholiness. 
Conversely, an excessive focus on the communal over the mystical dimension of this communion may reduce the church to a social impulse devoid of a spiritual component. The third model, model describes the church as a sacrament, namely as the visible sign of an invisible grace, which is Christ's presence through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. The seven sacraments of the church are central to the manifestation of this identity, but the church as a whole, not just its sacraments, is to be a sign of God's grace in a world that needs redemption. Then, when the church calls the nations to Eucharistic fellowship as a representative of Christ, it must do so convincingly by striving for the holiness, unity, and fellowship which it is meant to signify. Humans will always fall short of these ideals, of course, inside and outside of the church, but the grace of God will sanctify the church and make it an efficacious sacrament. The advantages of this model include a clear job description for the church as it points to its missionary commission and to the need to be the salt of the earth. It also unites the visible and invisible aspects of the church into one coherent whole. At the same time, it does not provide distinct criteria for discerning between the human and divine realities of the church, and its very articulation is challenging in secular contexts where the theological language of sacraments or mysteries is unintelligible. The fourth model is the church's herald, specifically as herald of God's word to the world. According to this model, the church is to evangelize or to proclaim the gospel as commissioned by Christ. In order to do so without hypocrisy, the church must first receive and welcome this message. It must hear and believe what it teaches as it continues to accept its responsibility to evangelize while leaving the desired results, including faith, conversion, and growth, to the power and will of God. In this context, since common language assembles and constitutes human communities, the employment of a shared language to teach this saving message is essential to the effectiveness of this endeavor. Strengths of this model include a strong biblical foundation in its support, since God's call to conversion and change is unequivocal, and a clear sense of mission and identity. If, however, God's word is only conceptualized as verbal propositions, this model could lead to a kind of formulaic legalism or abstract intellectualism that neglects much needed pragmatic action. The fifth model, and the last in Dulles' 1974 first edition of Models of the Church, corrects this potential distortion. This is where the church is described as servant, namely as an agent that alleviates suffering and brings relief from pain and want in the world. Then the church is not inherently an enemy of the world, but is a force for the healing of wounds that emerge not only within its ranks, but also without them. Through this particular focus, the church refrains from excessive self-serving as it engages, so to speak, in the washing of the feet of the ones it encounters. It thus continues in Jesus' work and in the process increases its own spiritual depth and holiness. To be sure, Dulles indicates that an excessive focus on this model could also lead to dangerous distortions. For example, since God is to continue to be the church's master in whose service the church is employed, Service of the world can mistakenly be equated with obedience to the world. Similarly, to give value to service actions in themselves may lead to neglect of the necessary spiritual foundations that contribute to make the service Christian, thus opening the door to secularist influences. In later editions of, the, of his book, Dolis added a sixth model, the church as community of disciples. While it does not replace the other models, this particular model is in some degree summative of them all, and it functions as a bridge between them. Central to this model of the church is the following job description, the formation of individuals in community for the Christian life. The New Testament, which is rich in discipleship language, highlights the developmental trajectory of individuals on this path. Although their evangelization is never complete, Disciples are learners who are both informed by and transformed through the teachings and experience of the church. In uniting action or service and instruction as the faithful are motiv motivated to imitate Christ in all their endeavors, this model links the herald and servant models. It further connects the sacramental and mystical communion models because Jesus is present in the community, is represented by it, and is the ultimate reason for it. It also resonates with the separateness inherent 
in the institution model because it calls for a radical break from worldly values while highlighting the need for divine grace in the path of discipleship. In Dulles's words, Christ's grace is not cheap but demanding, yet the demanding call brings with it the grace needed for its own acceptance. Let me skip something else that I'm saying about Catholicism here and move on to the Mormon section. So, um, while various classifications have been employed to describe different kinds of Mormons, including the famous Liahona iron rod dichotomy of Richard Paul, the recent online distinction between true believing Mormons and New Order Mormons, and the tongue in cheek five kinds of Mormons by Robert Kirby, uh, no comparable taxonomy exists for Mormon ecclesiology. I propose that such a description would be beneficial, and every Dulles' models can provide an impetus in this direction. Indeed, uh, these ecclesial models can largely be applied to the Mormon context, although slightly modified in terminology and emphasis so as to fit the fourfold mission or purposes of the LDS Church, namely perfecting the saints, proclaiming the gospel, redeeming the dead, and caring for the poor and needy. In the present context, I can only sketch these LDS models before concluding with a brief mention of some of the questions and tensions that could be usefully framed within this ecclesiological skeleton. Therefore, mine is only a preliminary endeavor which calls for further development and analysis. There is no doubt that Mormons conceptualize their church as a universal institution, which is visible, tangible, structured, and clearly demarcated. And a strong sense of corporate identity ensures that many members closely identify the church with its highest hierarchy, namely the prophet and the apostles. The Doctrine and Covenants gives emphasis to the church's institutional dimension by describing its authority and structure, and the notion of organization even permeates Mormon cosmology. Thus, the first Mormon ecclesiological model I propose is church's prophetic organization. Organization because the church is believed to have a divinely ordained structure that also happens to be functional, and prophetic because prophetic power is understood to be central to its authority claims. Indeed, the prophetic dimension is at the very heart of the church's raison d'etre, given the, the claims that Joseph Smith was divinely commissioned to org organize it, and that prophetic succession since his death ensures an unbroken line of ecclesial authority. It is also central to the identification of the church with the kingdom of God on the earth, and to the affirmation that it is the repository of true doctrine and salvific ordinances. Hence, those Mormons who claim that the church is perfect, but the members are not, clearly emphasize an institutional model of the church that centers around its doctrines, organization, or ordinances, and authority. For them, the members of the church are not the church. At the same time, the community dimension of Mormonism can be so strong as to have its internal bonds likened to the force of an ethnic group or tribe. Hence, my second model is Church as Zion Family, an appellative that unites 19th century's communal terminology to later emphases on the centrality of the family to healthy communities. LDS scriptures and hymns are replete with references to the covenantal unity of the Church, expressed both ge geographically and spiritually in the ideal society of Zion, which is characterized by holiness, brotherly love, and equality. Moreover, in family-centric Mormonism, the church is comparable to a nurturing parent that gives security, comfort, and answers, and its local manifestations of ward families are places where members are to cooperate and work together for the well-being of all, as is characteristic of good families. The church is then called to be the people of God and the body of Christ, the heavenly city of God on the earth, uniting in covenant to God. Mormons point to the Zion family of the church when they speak of church church callings or service, when they address each other as brothers and sisters, or emphasize their unity across time and space as the people of the covenant, or new Israel of the latter days, and when they take the church to the home in such activities as prayer, scripture study, and singing, and the home to the church. The Mormon sacrament, or what Catholics call the Eucharist, is central to LDS weekly worship. But Latter-day Saints employ the Protestant term ordinance rather than the Catholic term sacrament in reference to the broad category of ritual salvific signs that are administered by the church. 
Still, Mormon ordinances in their nature and significance may be closer to Catholic sacraments than to Protestant ordinances, although a sacramental theology of Mormonism is yet to be articulated in detail. What is sure is that Mormonism claims its legitimate priesthood authority enables its ordinances salvific efficacy. Hence, a third model is church as salvific priesthood, with priesthood being the divine authority that legitimates Mormon ordinances and salvific being the adjective that expresses the belief in the soteriological necessity of this authority and of its associated rituals. In this context, the LDS Church is not viewed as much as an ordinance or sacrament in itself, but rather as the repository, indeed the only repository of salvific ordinances, and of the priesthood authority that makes them fully efficacious. This is often what Mormons mean by affirming that theirs is the only true church, namely that the LDS Church is the only institution, society, and community that possesses salvific priesthood. There's also no doubt that the LDS Church is conceptualized as a herald of God's word, or to put it in Mormon terms, as a missionary. For a large portion of its history, this is the primary way in which Mormonism has conceived of itself as a servant of the world, namely as a serving missionary. More recently, however, a model of the church as servant in contexts that transcend evangelization has emerged more explicitly, particularly with the 2009 edition of the church's fourth universal purpose, to care for the poor and needy. This has been manifested through ongoing humanitarian service of people of any culture and persuasion who stand in need of food and shelter. The church's recent direct involvement in religious freedom issues and in the passing of Utah State Bill 296 point to a growing perception within it of the need to be a voice for balance and fairness beyond its own boundaries, namely to contribute to the betterment of the world even when the world does not accept its doctrinal message. Finally, in the LDS context, I would translate Dulles' community of disciples to school of exaltation. I highlight the term school because the Mormon worship experience involves a lot of instruction, which is central to all its relevant religious settings, namely the home, the church, and the temple. And formal education is also repeatedly emphasized and encouraged. Yet Mormon instruction is not only intellectual or propositional. It is also embodied in action through such things as service in church callings, missions, regular visits of members, etc. Then, within the broader school of earthly existence, the church is meant to function as a transforming school that elevates individuals to a higher sphere of sanctification. In the eschaton, graduation from this school ideally culminates in Mormonism's highest degree of salvation, i.e. family exaltation, although learning and knowledge acquisition are to continue through the eternity. To call the LDS Church a school of discipleship would certainly be appropriate, but the temple, which functions in many ways as the pinnacle of eternal education, explicitly affirms exaltation as the ultimate objective of priesthood and minister church-nurtured covenants. In conclusion, although the specific, specific labels I propose for the LDS models of the church can either be debated or elaborated, at the center of this discussion is a recognition that Dulles' employment of ecclesiological models facilitates the description of complex and multifaceted ecclesial realities. Then, in the context of what Terrell Givens calls the paradoxes of Mormonism or the constructive tensions between its foundational principles, these models can provide a framework within which some of the most pressing questions of contemporary Mormonism may be addressed. To name only a few, to what extent is the prophetic organization open to enculturation into distinctive international Zion families? How can the humanity of the people of God be absorbed into the perfection of God's kingdom on earth? What is the relationship between the authority of a salvific priesthood and the role of personal agency, even of dissent? How does a missionary church engage in dialogue with the unevangelized world so as to teach and learn at the same time? How is the identity of a church affected by its predominant ecclesiological models? As a whole, if gospel principles exist in constructive tension with each other, could the same be said about Mormonism's ecclesiological models? I hope to have given you some food for thought. Thank you.
Thank you, Mauro. That was terrific. Uh, it is an honor to be sharing this session with, uh, with friends. Uh, Mauro and I taught together in the philosophy department here. Welcome back to our campus. And, uh, and I also want to recognize all the great work that's gone into this event. So if I can, take this opportunity to publicly thank and recognize uh, Boyd Peterson, my assistant, uh, Susanna Garcia, elect, uh, Alex Strasberg, and other student, uh, students who have helped along with this. Please join me in thanking them. At first blush, it appears that there are stark differences between Mormons and Catholics on questions of revelation and doctrinal authority. After all, Latter-day Saints affirm the following as one of their articles of faith. We believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. One may contrast this with the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation produced by the Second Vatican Council at the conclusion of this monumental event in 1965. The Christian dispensation, therefore, as the new and definitive covenant, will never pass away, and we now await no further new public revelation before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. To put it succinctly, in the Catholic tradition, the incarnation of the Son is the supreme revelation of God. The life and teachings of Jesus Christ and those of his apostles brought this specific form of revelation to an end. Public revelation comes in the form of the deposit of faith, which is constituted by both sacred scripture and sacred tradition. The Catholic Church maintains apostolic authority through the line of bishops, among whose job it is to preserve, protect, and apply the deposit of faith. The church thus maintains doctrinal authority in the form of the magisterium, which is described as the teaching office of the church, and which regulates the integrity of doctrine and theology in its ultimate connection to the deposit. The magisterium contains multiple levels which require different forms of, ob of obedience and assent. In this way, Catholics are able to formally organize authoritative discourse and separate definitive and infallible teaching from that which is subject to revision and development. Latter-day Saints, on the other hand, affirm both continuing revelation through living prophets and an open canon of scripture. Joseph Smith is understood to have restored the proper form of the Church of Jesus Christ and with it, in their minds, a return of revelation through the prophetic office. The LDS First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles are understood to be prophets, seers, and revelators. As a collective body, they maintain apostolic authority, regulate the integrity of LDS church teaching, and receive revelation on behalf of the church. In this brief presentation, I will offer what I consider to be a primer on questions of revelation and authority within these two traditions and do so with attention, with attention to intriguing questions that deserve more careful and sustained attention. My guiding question here is the extent to which the Catholic and LDS churches resemble one another in how they conceptualize revelation and in how they, re and in how they regulate its expression within their respective contexts. My observations have led me to conclude that there are surprisingly strong similarities, some of which were pointed out by Mauro in his excellent presentation, and further, that these practices of the LDS Church increasingly resemble those of their Catholic colleagues. In contrast to most other religious traditions, both Catholics and Latter-day Saints maintain clearly defined central authority. Catholicism has a long-standing legal and theological tradition from which they draw. Mormons, on the other hand, attempt to maintain doctrinal consistency in the absence of systematic theology and the legalization of authoritative discourse. At the Kirtland Temple dedication in 1836, the saints proclaimed in song that, quote, the veil over the earth is beginning to burst, end quote. Throughout the course of his prophetic career, Joseph Smith produced a new translation of the Bible, 
three additional volumes of scripture, and a wealth of uncanonized accounts of revelatory activity. The exuberance of the early LDS church is exemplified in Joseph Smith's 1839 revelation in which he records the voice of God saying, what power shall stay the heavens? As well might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course or to turn it upstream as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints." End quote. As the prophet to the dispensation of the fullness of times, Joseph Smith is understood by Mormons to have restored the fullness of the gospel. That's an LDS term and, and used by other Christians. This meant that the restoration project developed beyond Christian primitivism to include the restoration of all things, including the whole doctrine of redemption contained in the revelation of Jesus. Applying the restitution of all things mentioned in Acts 3 to the mission of Joseph Smith, the church teaches that every gospel truth and blessing and all priesthood authority, keys, ordinances, and covenants necessary for mankind's eternal salvation have been or will be restored in this dispensation. Nevertheless, of the hundreds of pages of revelations recorded by Smith, most were produced in a relatively short period of time. By the time of the 1835 publication of the Doctrine and Covenants, some four years prior to the revelation referenced above, Early spontaneity had given way to more discrimination and caution in the scope and distribution of revelation. The death of Joseph Smith in 1844 accelerated the transformation of continuing revelation from charismatic to increasingly bureaucratic production. Though Latter-day Saints affirmed that the prophetic office was perpetuated through Brigham Young and his successors, the position has functioned more in terms of a presiding officer than a charismatic seer. Since Smith's 1844 martyrdom, the church has produced four publicly recognized and officially sanctioned revelations. In the case of the 1878 priesthood revelation, for example, the church offered a brief statement that the revelation came to President Spencer W. Kimball, quote, after extended meditation and prayer in the sacred rooms of the Holy Temple, end quote. Thus, in contrast to many of the revelations through Joseph Smith, contemporary revelation is understood to come primarily in forms other than theophanies and divine utterance. Of course, most of these observations are nothing new. As far back as 1963, sociologist Thomas O'Day characterized early, Mormonism, early Mormon leadership as a prime example of the routinization of charisma, a concept made famous by Max Weber in his theory of social and economic organization. O'Day argued that, given the tensions between democratization and authority present among the early Latter-day Saints, it was, quote, important for Mormonism to control and contain the very prophetic charisma upon which it was based, end quote. What makes this issue worth exploring now, I believe, are the ways in which the trend continues toward the domestication of revelation, both in form and dissemination. In 1997, for example, and to the surprise of many Latter-day Saints, President Gordon B. Hinckley declared, quote, now we don't need a lot of continuing revelation. We have a great basic reservoir of revelation. But if a problem arises, as it does occasionally, a vexatious thing with which we have to deal, we go to the Lord in prayer. We discuss it as a first presidency and as a council of the 12 apostles. We pray about it, and then comes the whisperings of a still small voice, and we know the direc direction we should take, and we proceed accordingly. In another interview within a few months uh, with the San Francisco Chronicle, he states something very similar. He says, let me say first that we have a great body of revelation, the vast majority of which came from the prophet Joseph Smith. We don't need much revelation. We need to pay more attention to the revelation we've already received, end quote. This sensibility was further solidified in the 2011 commentary entitled Divine Revelation in Modern Times. Though acknowledging the range of revelatory authority in the Bible, the document affirms that, quote, Mormons generally believe 
that divine guidance comes quietly, taking the form of impressions, thoughts, and feelings carried by the Spirit of God. End quote. At, what, at one point, the terms inspiration and revelation are used synonymously in connection to the experience of the leadership in governing the affairs of the church. Other points reaffirmed in the document include the connection between revelatory authority and ecclesiastical office. The document goes on, quote, church leaders are blessed with revelation in their capacity as church leaders, just as individuals are enlightened in the context of their own lives. Revelation permeates the church, bottom, top, and in between. Like a river guided by its banks, Revelation received by church leadership throw, flows through an orderly channel. Doctrinal, administrative, and policy questions, for example, are carefully weighed against historical precedent. The foundational revelations and teachings of the church serve as the basis for decision making. Church leaders work outward from the already established foundation of scripture, teachings, practices, and traditions to chart a course for the future." End quote. Again, these distinctions are not novel within Mormonism. However, their, pre their emphasis on precedent and tradition invites us to compare this approach to Catholic teaching on doctrinal authority and the centuries of debate associated with these issues. In particular, the choice of President Hinckley's word reservoir has intriguing resonances with the Catholic concept of deposit. As we touched upon above, the deposit of faith is understood in Catholic life as, quote, the body of saving truth entrusted by Christ to the apostles and handed on to them to be preserved and proclaimed. Catholic ecclesiology is necessarily backward looking. The deposit is something that is guarded and expounded in the application of what has already been received in the incarnation, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. All dogma, theology, and church teachings must ultimately find their ground in this deposit. The Catholic Church affirms that it listens to it, meaning the deposit, devoutly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully in accord with the divine commission and with the help of the Holy Spirit. It draws from this one deposit of faith everything which it presents for belief as divinely revealed. End quote. Thus, the activity of God in the church does not include any new public revelation, as we saw, but rather in preserving what in finality and completion has already been revealed in Jesus Christ. The emphasis on public revelation is crucial here. Catholics do not deny what they call private or particular revelation. Rather, what they deny is that the church as a whole will receive new revelation necessary for salvation. Though Latter-day Saints continue to orient themselves toward, excuse me, continue to orient themselves in anticipation of new revelatory knowledge, contemporary discourse, as we observed above, tends toward the preservation of existing revelation rather than the production of new revelatory content. President Hinckley's statements above take us back to earlier expressions, including that of George Q. Cannon at the turn of the 20th century. Speaking of the Mormons, he says, quote, we have been blessed as a people with an abundance of revelation. Some have deceived themselves with the idea that because revelations have not been written down and published, therefore there has been a lessening of power in the Church of Christ. This is a very great mistake, end quote. He adds that the church, quote, has been continually led by the spirit of revelation, though the men who have held the keys have not always felt led to write revelations as the prophet Joseph did, end quote. However, the task of sifting revelatory truth from human imperfection has been a challenging task. Though Joseph Smith distinguished his revelations from other forms of preaching and commentary, it was not always easy to tell where revelation ended and human in interpretation began. Smith himself declared that a prophet is not always a prophet, only when he is acting as such. That's one of the most famous quotes from 
Joseph Smith, at least on this question. But it has not been entirely clear exactly when the prophets have been speaking as such. Elder Todd Christofferson acknowledged this point in his April 2012 General Conference address entitled The Doctrine of Christ. Echoing, early LDS, er, echoing an earlier LDS newsroom commentary, he declares that, quote, not every statement made by a church leader past or present necessarily constitutes doctrine. A single statement made by a single leader on a single occasion often represents a personal, though well-considered opinion, but is not meant to be officially binding for the whole church, end quote. Thus, LDS leadership has tended to downplay or ignore historical idiosyncrasies and focused instead on the discourse of the current prophet. This approach is expressive of the optimistic and progressive nature of Mormon thought, I believe. The faithful believe that continuing revelation will shake off errant teachings of the past as the church majestically rolls forward. An important qualifier to this was articulated in the October 2013 General Conference Address by President Dieter Uchtdorf. In this address, he very publicly acknowledged that there have been times when church leaders have said or done things which, quote, were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine, end quote. However, he quickly followed this up with an affirmation that in spite of these mistakes, Quote, the eternal truth of the restored gospel found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not tarnished, diminished, or destroyed, end quote. Uchtdorf's ideas gesture toward the idea that dubious teachings can be, have been, and will be identified and tossed overboard over time. One might call this a Mormon form of the magisterium via omission. That's my term. We'll see if it holds up. Recall the earlier LDS statement asserting that revelation, quote, permeates the church, bottom, top, and in between. In his landmark speech in 1954, J. Reuben Clark of the LDS First Presidency attempted to navigate these questions by arguing that, quote, we can tell when the speakers or church leaders are moved upon by the Holy Ghost only when we ourselves are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. In a way, this completely shifts the responsibility from them to us to determine when they so speak, end quote. Clark's principle here has resonance with another Catholic concept known as the census fidelium. The idea here is that Christ fulfills his purposes, quote, not only through the hierarchy who teach in his name and with his authority, but also through the laity whom he made his witnesses and to whom he gave understanding of the faith, end quote. Appealing to the New Testament promise that the Holy Spirit would always be with the church, the document further specifies that, quote, the entire body of the faithful, anointed as they are by the Holy One, cannot err in matters of belief. They manifest this special property by means of the whole people's supernatural discernment in matters of faith when, from the bishops down to the last of the lay faithful, they show universal agreement in matters of faith and morals, end quote. This discernment is said to be, quote, exercised under the guidance of the sacred teaching authority in faithful and respectful obedience. Through it, the people of God adhere unwaveringly to the faith once given and for all to the saints, end quote. A practical illustration can be seen in Pope John Paul II's 2004 letter to the Inquisition Symposium in which he draws the distinction between what he calls the authentic census fide and what he calls the prevailing mentality of a given period. He acknowledges that the passage of time allows the church to receive what he calls a more profound awareness of their fidelity to the deposit of faith. So though the census fide and the census fidelium may be invoked as, quote, a just judgment on the past life of the church, it may not serve as a corrective to current magisterial teaching. Pope Benedict cemented this point in his 2012 address to the International Theological Commission, in which he says, today, 
It is particularly important to explain the criteria that make it possible to distinguish the, authentic, the authentic census fidelium and invoking it in order to contest the teachings of the magisterium would be unthinkable. Since the census fide cannot be authentically developed in believers, and this is the key point, except to the extent in which they fully participate in the life of the church, and this demands responsible adherence to the magisterium, the deposit of faith." End quote. Returning to J. Reuben Clark, a comparable dynamic is present in his address uh, that he delivered and on which I quoted above. He affirms that what he calls the, expedi the excuse me, adventurous expeditions by LDS church leaders will be ferreted out by the Holy Ghost in the body of the members, and that in due time the church will know which of these have been set aside and which are genuinely revelatory. He is equally emphatic, however, that the president of the church is in a privileged position of authority when it comes to the production of new revelation or binding interpretations of scripture or doctrine. All of this brings us to acknowledge the reciprocal dynamic present in both traditions when it comes to questions of authority and receptivity. Though each appeals to the receptivity of the faithful, a sensible question involves the extent to which this receptivity can be said to actually regulate the church, excuse me, can be said to actually regulate church teaching as opposed to merely affirming authoritative discourse. And though regulation and affirmation are not mutually exclusive, there is the potential for conflict. And as we have observed on occasion in both Mormonism and Catholicism, uh, mischief might occur. Each tradition has mechanisms for dealing with wayward teachings such that the census fidelium can be interpreted and regulated precisely through authoritative discourse. In the case of Catholicism, legalistic distinctions have provided a way to address the messiness and confusion of centuries of theological interpretation, cultural influences, and denominational schism. However, from the perspective of newer and more atheological traditions, such as Mormonism, doctrinal legalism can cut both ways. It can help bring clarity out of chaos, but it can also lead to further confusion and, as I mentioned, occasional mischief. Alternatively, the absence of theological reflection can lead to other forms of mischief, including the avoidance of inconsistencies and other challenges that come with revelatory traditions. Despite these ongoing challenges, Latter-day Saints share with their Catholic neighbors the theological claim that despite human failing and historical change, the church, as it is understood by each, has maintained its integrity as the body of Christ and the people of God. In Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Council declared that, quote, the church is strengthened by the power of God's grace promised to her by the Lord, so that in the weakness of the flesh, she may not waver from perfect fidelity, end quote. Rejecting the apostasy and the need for restoration, Catholic teaching maintains that the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit has always been able to overcome political entanglements, misguided teachings, and sinful practices. A similar conviction is present among Latter-day Saints regarding their post-restoration organization. Despite the vagaries of history, a key feature of contemporary Mormonism is the conviction that the activity of the Holy Spirit will not allow their church to be led astray now that we have entered what Mormons understand to be the dispensation of the fullness of times. Given this comparative primer, I hope both traditions will continue to explore these areas of mutual interest and be able to identify what is valuable and insightful in the other. I observe an opportunity here for growth in understanding that will lead to more accurate, more respectful, and more beneficial representations, something I hope we can all agree is valuable, both from an academic and a religious perspective. Thank you.